Hi, today I'm going to be walking you through uh, writing up and uh, getting ready some input files for uh, simulating magnetite. Um, in general, the steps I'm going to show you are going to be quite transferable to any complex crystal structures, Strange. but hopefully um, I'll be able to explain everything uh, quite clearly so that uh, you'll know what you'll need to do when you need to make these for yourself. So first of all, um, as with pretty much any simulation we do in Vampire, we're going to need an input file as well as a material file. Um, the input file itself for Magnesite is pretty regular. Uh, there's nothing special in there. Um, it's got a lattice constant of um, about 8.4 angstroms. Uh, and you're going to need to lay out your system dimensions, what kind of simulation you're going to do, and outputs. Um, the only particular thing that you might be putting in this input file is a new parameter that we have, which is create crystal structure spinel. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit later about this, but uh, for now, just bear it in mind. Let me show you an input file that I have, which I've used in one of my simulations. Yeah. So uh, this particular input file would be for a spherical nanoparticle of magnetite. Um, so I've got create sphere there up at the top. Um, I've got the dimensions already. Uh, this is going to be a Monte Carlo time series simulation. Um, so normally I would use this, for example, for uh, a series of simulations to make um, magnetization versus temperature graphs. You do a whole bunch of these simulations with varying temperatures and put them together to get a nice um, M versus T curve. But aside from that, this is pretty normal for an input file that you might have dealt with uh, when already using Vampire. So moving on to the material file, here's where things start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, so you might want to compare this to the material file provided for Cobalt in the Vampire source. You see that there's a lot more things going on here. So we've got three materials. Uh, we've got an FeA sublattice, we've got an FeB sublattice, and oxygen. Uh, so in magnetite, you've got uh, two sublattices that are working against each other. Magnetite is a ferry magnet. Um, you've got uh, the A sites, uh, of which there are eight iron atoms, which are uh, in, you know, let's say, positive 111, that's magnetite's easy axis. Uh, and then you've got 16 uh, atoms of iron on the B sites, which are facing the opposite direction, anti-parallel. Um, and so because there's uh, twice the number of FEB sites, this material can behave a lot like a ferromagnet. So if you know a little bit about magnetite, that's what initially people thought it was. You've also got the oxygen completely dispersed across the material. Um, there's 32 atoms of oxygen in the unit cell, um, but it's not magnetic, uh, and for the most part, we don't really have to worry about it. Um, of course, in this material file, you're going to have to have a few things for everything already set up. You're going to have to have the uh, exchange interaction values. You're going to have to have the anisotropies. And the one final thing you're going to have to have, which is very important, because this is going to link each material to its particular position in the unit cell file later, is this one line, um, material, it'll be material one, two, three, unit cell cate category one, two, three. Um, so let me show you a material file that I've used quite often. Yeah, so here we go. Um, as you can see, the first two materials, so both of them are iron, um, they're very similar. They've got damping constants, uh, their, um, their moments, uh, all of the exchange between the two materials, and finally that important last line for each one, unit cell category. So one has category one, material two has category two, and you'll see that oxygen has, oh, actually this is missing the line. That should have category three. Um, so uh, the reason that was missing is because sometimes I don't actually include a third material for oxygen, which 
doesn't make a difference because it's non-magnetic. But nowadays, actually, there's a very nice parameter we can use, um, which removes oxygen from the statistics in Vampire. And so when you want to pull out uh, magnetization data, for example, you won't have to worry about accounting for the extra oxygen atoms. Uh, and that parameter is um, non-magnetic remove. Um, it should be noted that there is the exchange here for oxygen, it's set to zero. Uh, as far as I know, you can actually leave this out and oxygen will be treated as having zero exchange by default. Uh, similarly, with the cubic anisotropy constant and the spin moment, the, the, those don't have any effect. The material is non-magnetic. Uh, as soon as uh, we've uh, get told it this, then Vampire knows how to deal with it, basically. So finally, um, there is a very big file that we have to deal with for complex crystal structures very often, which is the unit cell file. Now, the unit cell file is going to give us all of the information about our material, um, the atomic positions, the exchanges, and um, unfortunately, that's not quite as easy to write up. So for magnetite, for example, I had to write a portion of code uh, to uh, build this file because there's a bit of menial work in putting it all together. So let me just bring up a unit cell file and show you. So if I just quickly scroll through the file, you'll see that there's quite a lot to it. But let's break it down first of all. So the beginning of the file just tells you the lattice constants. Actually, um, if these are different to the values in the input file, they will be chosen used by default. Um, so these are actually what tells Vampire the actual lattice uh, constants of your material. Uh, you've got the unit cell vectors, which tell you the orientation of the unit cell. Actually, that's pretty much always cubic. Uh, I don't think Vampire can deal with non-cubic unit cells for now. Um, and then we, the next thing we have is a list of atomic positions. So this is obviously not too hard to get your hands on. Um, what you would want to do if you have a different material and you want to create this is you could find out what kind of crystal structure your material have. So uh, I'm talking about the crystallographic groups. Um, magnetite is FD3M, for example. And you want to go onto a crystallographic database, uh, find out uh, on which sites your material's atoms typically lie on and basically use that. The crystallographic databases usually have a set of uh, formulae uh, that allow you to work out the exact fractional positions of your material's uh, atomic coordinates. Um, so again, it's a bit of work, but nothing too crazy yet. Um, in terms of what all these numbers mean, so this comment actually gives you a bit of a hint. So first thing we have is the number of atoms in our unit cell. There's 56 in magnetite. Uh, uh, that's followed by the first column is simply an atom ID. So 0 to 55. The next three values are the fractional coordinates of each atom. And then the last three columns, <laughs> um, I don't know how to explain not exactly they all are, but I know that it, for me, uh, the first column and the last column correspond to the material type. So zero for the first eight atoms, uh, zero to seven, uh, one for the next 16, and then two for all the oxygen atoms, similarly for the last column. These are very important because they allow you to tie your material file with your unit cell file. Uh, you remember that parameter that we had, um, unit cell cat category, that looks at these values to figure out which materials correspond to which positions. There's also this middle column um, that again here is the same as the atom ID. Uh, I wish I could remember what it's for exactly, but uh, I'll just leave it here for now. Uh, so there are all 55 atoms. And then following that, we have the interaction list. Now, this is a bit more difficult to do because here you're going to have to write up a bit of code um, build a unit cell of your material and then well depending on the exchange type that your material has so for magnetite we've got nearest neighbor exchange um what we have what what i had to do for this is 
or well, technically I didn't do this myself, but um, what is needed for this is you have to create a unit cell of your material, so magnetite, and then you have to create neighboring unit cells and work out you know, the n squared interactions between every single atom, reduce them to only the nearest neighbor, and then list out every unique interaction. So what you're looking at here is, again, the comment tells you a little bit about what you're, what you're seeing. Um, so the number of interactions, 768, the type, normalized isotropic, and then interaction ID, zero to 767, the atom A, uh, sorry, uh, atom I ID, atom J ID. So this is uh, your, you know, magnetite atom ID zero interacting with magnetite atom ID three. Uh, the next three values tell you uh, which unit cell this is interacting with. So this is unit cell minus one, minus one, minus one. So your your origin, original unit cell is zero, zero, zero. And this is one of the, the many unit cells surrounding your system. And then finally, actually, the last column is completely ones, uh, and these will be substituted automatically by Vampire with the exchange interaction values that you have in your material file. So, like I said, the init cell file is a bit of trouble to actually get a hold of and make sure everything is correct. It's definitely a bit of coding work that you have to do for different materials, um, but once you have it, you can use it for 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 uh, pretty much all of your needs with you know different types of simulations with that material so i mentioned earlier there is a new parameter and that parameter is the easy answer to the unit cell file uh, at least for magnetite so far so if i just go back to it oh yeah here's one slide just expanding a few more components of the unit cell um, there is this create crystal structure spinel parameter and it basically allows you to do without the unitel file for spinel uh, materials. Um, so if I include this line into the input file um, and uh, I have to make sure that I, so let me just show you here in this input file, you'll see the line create crystal structure spinel. Currently it's commented out. What I can do is uncomment that to use it. And then I also have to make sure that I comment out the material unit cell file location. So the input file needs to know the name of the unit cell file you're using. So I comment that out and that way I can run a simulation of magnetite without a unit cell file. It's the, the unit cell file is basically built into vampire for spinel materials. Now, in general, you probably won't have this available to you if you're not looking at spinels. Uh, this is quite new, and so we are slowly adding new general material crystal structures as we go. Um, but uh, basically, sometimes you will have to fall back on having uh, making your own unit you know, cell file. But yeah, once you've got all those three things together, um, you're pretty much free to do any kind of simulation you would have done with a more simple material. Any of the practice that you've had with, uh, you know, simple cobalt files uh, in, in Vampire Source, you can now do everything uh, that you did with that on Magnetite. Um, yeah.